So uh, without any uh, more delay, I'm going to turn it over to the general. He'll have some opening comments for you. Then we'll get the questions just like before. I will moderate uh, the Q&A. Um, I'd ask you to please identify yourself and who you're with uh, before you ask your question and keep the follow-ups to a minimum so we can get around as, to as many people as we can over the course of uh, 30 minutes. And then we'll toss it back to the general for any closing comments. So with that, General Van Herc, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, John, and good morning. It's uh, great to be with you again today. I'm here to update you on uh, U.S. Northcom's support to Operation Allies Welcome, and I'm also going to provide you with an update on our other ongoing efforts, as John mentioned. In addition to our mission of defending the homeland, U.S. Northcom continues to provide COVID medical assistance in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and now beginning today in Idaho, while supporting wildland firefighting in the western United States. Currently, there are approximately 200 soldiers deployed to fight the fire, the Dixie Fire, in Northern California, and our MAFs-equipped C-130s have dropped more than 2.2 million gallons of fire retardant. We're also conducting Hurricane Ida relief efforts assisting FEMA, the lead federal agency, by providing high water vehicles and road clearing capabilities. U.S. Northcom uh, continues uh, its support the Department of Defense's as a lead combatant command for Operation Allies uh, Welcome in the continental United States. U.S. Northcom is providing oversight and support of the lead federal agency, the Department of Homeland Security. Northcom is working around the clock building capacity to support Afghan personnel. Today, our total capacity at eight different installations is approximately 36,000. And our Afghan evacuee population is approximately 25,600. We're working to increase capacity to at least 50,000. And we continue to provide culturally appropriate food, water, bedding, religious services, recreational activities, and other services such as transportation from the port of entry to the location of accommodations and some medical services. My team of military, civilian, and contract personnel continue working closely with numerous agencies, both government and non-government, to ensure further requirements and additional capabilities are available for these Afghan personnel. I have visited four of the eight task forces operating at DOD locations across the U.S. Yesterday, I visited Task Force Liberty at Joint Base mcguire dix Lakehurst. I saw the amazing commitment and pride from our service members and interagency partners working together to support our Afghan guests. Our nation's dedicated and talented soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and Coast Guardsmen continue to provide Afghan personnel a safe harbor so that the Department of Homeland Security can continue their immigration process. Since the beginning of this mission, our most pressing priority was to quickly construct safe accommodations arrange transportation and provide meals for our Afghan guests. That capacity building effort continues. Our team of interagency partners, contractors, and the DOD has not wavered in its commitment to temporarily house our guests in the safest conditions. This is an unprecedented effort. Along with many partners, we're identifying challenges, resolving issues, and implementing change where needed. I'm grateful for the support of the states and the local communities surrounding our installations and for the volunteers and others who are aiding our efforts. Our top priority remains providing a safe and secure environment for our guests to continue their immigration process in order to transition into their new lives in the United States. This has been a massive military, diplomatic, and humanitarian undertaking, one of the most difficult in our nation's history and an extraordinary feat of logistics and global coordination under some of the most challenging circumstances imaginable. We're honored and proud to assist these Afghan personnel. I'm now ready to take any questions, John. Thank you, General. We'll start with uh, Lita. She's on the phone. General, uh, thanks a lot for, for doing this. Um, uh, just a couple things. You're talking about a capacity of 50,000. Can you say, do you expect how many more bases you will need to tap in order to meet that expectation? And secondly, can you just give us um, your thoughts and what you've seen on security challenges, any violence, any um, security vetting issues that you've seen or heard about at any of the camps? Have there been um, any, uh, any problems of that regard? Thank you. Thanks, Lita. Uh, as far as bases, we, we currently have eight task forces at eight different locations. 
uh, ready to expand if needed. At this time, I do not anticipate uh, needing any additional bases uh, to reach the capacity we need of at least 50,000. As far as security, uh, I'm not aware of any incidents that have made it to my level on the task forces. I believe that's the question that you're asking. I would tell you that uh, we're partnering uh, with not only our, our military folks, but our federal law enforcement and other agencies uh, to ensure a safe and secure environment for the Afghans. We're also working closely with uh, Afghans uh, to put a, a command and control construct in place. Yesterday at uh, Fort uh, Dix at the McGuire Dix Lakehurst Task Force Liberty, I was very impressed to see that we've put a mayor cell in place where we have uh, military officers uh, and Afghan counterparts in the village, if you will, working together to solve the issues that you're talking about. But no security issues have risen to my level. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hi. General Van Herk, it's Megan Myers from Military Times. I wanted to ask how many Afghans NORTHCOM has received, how many have uh, been resettled and moved off of installations, um, and about how long that process is taking and which final processes are taking place on bases here. Okay, Megan. So more than 25,600 uh, are currently uh, with United States North, NORTHCOM task forces. As far as how long and how many have uh, processed through, uh, it's more than 800 at Task Force uh, Eagle at Fort Lee. Uh, and then at the other locations, we're beginning to ramp up. So I would say approximately 1,000, uh, but I don't have a specific number to give you. That would be best handled by DHS and Department of State who are responsible for that. As far as the duration, again, that's really DHS and Department of State. Uh, I will tell you that right now they're in the policy uh, planning mode for exactly the procedure for, that will be utilized for either asylum processing or special immigrant visa processing. Uh, we look forward to finalizing that. I talked with Mr. Bob Fenton yesterday while at uh, Joint Base uh, uh, Dix, uh, McGuire Dix Lakehurst. Bob Fenton is the DHS lead for Operation Allies Welcome. And uh, he's working closely with our team so that we become as efficient and effective as possible in the outflow process. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking this question. Uh, Travis Tritton with military.com. Um, could you describe your role in COVID testing and um, tell us what uh, positivity rate you're seeing among the uh, Afghan evacuees? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Travis. Uh, our, our role at the task forces is to test every single uh, Afghan personnel that comes in. They're also tested at uh, Dulles as well, but that is not done under United States Northern Command. So we're testing all of them. Uh, last week during my uh, trip, uh, we visited uh, Bliss and McCoy, and we saw at one location three positive uh, COVID tests out of more than 1,300, uh, one at another location out of 1,200. And yesterday during my visit to Task Force Liberty, there was no concern expressed by the commanders or any of the medical professionals about COVID positivity rates or testing. Okay, we'll go back to the phones. Uh, Dan Lamoth. Hey, good morning. Thanks for your time today. Uh, wanted to ask, uh, we've seen a couple advertisements asking uh, internally for AFPAC hands types, uh, military personnel, assumedly that have some familiar, familiarity with Dari, Pashto, that kind of thing. Uh, can you speak at all to what you need in terms of um, U.S. military personnel that can speak to Afghans and who don't speak English and, and where you are right now handling that? Thanks. Hey, Dan, that's a great question. So during my visit yesterday, uh, two outstanding officers who were AFPAC hands, uh, one of them was a Space Force officer who recently transitioned to the Space Force from the Air Force, and the other was an Air Force officer who both volunteered to do this mission once they uh, saw the importance of it. Uh, both of them uh, fluent in the languages uh, and very helpful. In addition to that, the, uh, the headquarters Air Force has provided a cultural advisor, again, fluent in the languages to help uh, with the cultural challenges that everybody needs to understand. Uh, with regards to uh, interpreters, uh, linguists, those kinds of things to support, uh, those are challenges. Uh, we're, we're seeking uh, as many as we can through the interagency process. We've also had a, a request for forces out to DOD for additional support. Uh, I'm confident that we're going to get that support as we go forward. Uh, great people volunteering to help us out. Okay, Jenny. Uh, I'm Jenny Park with the USA Journal Korea. Um, 
I, I, I just want to ask you about not related with Afghanistan, different issues. General, as you know, that the IAEA has released a report uh, on the restart of North Korea's nuclear reactors. IAEA says it's a matter of serious uh, concern. What are your concerns and uh, countermeasures against the North Korea nuclear and uh, missile test? Thank you. Uh, hey, thanks for your question. Uh, United States Northern Command and uh, NORAD stand ready to provide our mission capabilities. For NORAD, that's threat warning and attack assessment. For NORTHCOM, ballistic missile defense capability. I'm ready 24-7, uh, 365, if uh, North Korea decides to launch a ballistic missile. I'm confident in our capabilities. I'm aware of the report that you're talking about. That does not change my posture. We continue to be ready to respond should North Korea elect to launch a missile. Thank you. Barb? General Van Herc, a couple of follow-ups. You, you talked about this uh, mayor's cell. Can you tell us a little bit more? Is this something that's going to happen at all the other uh, sites? Uh, how are you trying to give Afghans more of a voice in uh, their conditions right now? My second follow-up to that is, you, you mentioned a couple of times things not coming to your level of attention. I'm wondering how you're ensuring that um, any problems regarding food, sanitation, uh, care, standardizing care, how these do come to your attention so you can, you know, so you make sure people tell you when there are problems. What's, what's that level you've set when you want something brought to your attention? Thanks, Barb. Uh, yeah, I, I, great opportunity to talk about the mayor's cell, and it has been uh, perpetuated across all of the task forces. I'm really encouraged with what I see at the task forces with sharing lessons and continuous improvement processes. The mayor's cell is a, is a great idea. Uh, we take our military uh, leaders, we put them into the mayor's cell. They're responsible for uh, a specific uh, location, may, maybe a few dorms, uh, a dorm or two. Uh, and they have a counterpart on the Afghan side uh, that would essentially be their equal, if you will, in rank. This is great because not only does it allow the Afghans to express uh, their uh, concerns or challenges or where they need resources or uh, help, it allows us to also communicate with them uh, through uh, the same process and they can uh, perpetuate that information across the entire task force and across of all of the uh, Afghan population. So, so for example, the second part of your question, where you may have concerns such as sanitization or something like that, this is a great venue and a method to be able to express that. We have cultural differences uh, and, and those are things that we're working on, educating uh, both the Afghans and our people on the challenges that we face from a cultural perspective in understand, uh, understanding that we uh, each understand each each person's perspective. And so this this process of, of the mayor cell has been very, very uh, influential in helping us get after that. With regards to information that flows to my level, Barb, uh, there are uh, uh, things called commander's critical uh, information requirements. And I lay those out specifically on things that I want to be notified about. And then I empower the commanders that work for me from multiple levels all the way down to the lowest level to when they deem necessary that something's going to get attention, uh, that they are going to contact me. I'm very confident that if there was an incident uh, of serious nature, uh, that I would be in the loop at this point. And uh, so when I say I haven't uh, been made aware of any, I'm confident that we're in a good position there. I can't tell you there hasn't been any incidents at all, uh, but they haven't been serious enough to be addressed at my level. Can I just follow up? Um, so no, just to make sure I understand, nothing has been reported to you, correct me if I'm wrong, and I am still wondering, there have been sporadic um, reports, I, I grant absolutely sporadic, of problems of sanitation and food and that sort of thing. Um, is there anything that um, you may be just hearing about in your travels around that they're doing to ensure there's a standardized process so at all these bases where so many people are located, the local commanders have some standardization and, and know what they need to look for. 
but nothing is, I just want to make sure, nothing has come to your level? Barb, nothing has come to my level to address. I'm aware of the sanitization issues you talk about, a text that was uh, uh, posted on social media on uh, August 29th. I believe that uh, text was referring to some conditions at uh, Donna Anna at Fort Bliss, Task Force Bliss. Uh, the, the reason I became aware was through that text uh, process that, that allowed me to become aware. The mayor sale process that we were just talking about has been influential in helping educate and understand uh, the expectations for our visitors. Uh, helping understand uh, for our contractors who provide a lot of the sanitization support uh, as well. And so we continue to improve. Now, Barb, I would tell you, I'm building eight small cities, okay? We're going to have challenges, just like you do across the nation in various locations. And so uh, I, I'm comfort comfortable and confident uh, that we have processes in place to continue to address any of these challenges. Uh, moving forward. And uh, so I look forward to uh, showing you at some point uh, in the future when we can, I think you'll be incredibly impressed uh, with what we're doing. Sylvie. Hello, General Sylvie Lantome from AFP. Um, we heard reports about um, children separated uh, from their families during the evacuation. Do you have any case of uh, children uh, uh, traveling alone and what how do you deal with them hey, thank you great question so we've had a couple of unaccompanied children arrive at our task forces uh, they're immediately identified and health and human services is the lead agency to take responsibility for any unaccompanied children uh, in each case they have quickly adapted and take responsibility for those children each of their personnel are certified trained uh, very experienced uh, to handle these cases. We do not uh, retain responsibility for those, but we do identify them and pass them on to Health and Human Services. Where do they go? I would defer to Health and Human Services for that. Uh, Health and Human Services, I believe, has facilities in Washington, D.C., uh, near Dulles, where they're currently housing any unaccompanied children. Uh, what, what I've seen is they're incredibly uh, fast in trying to work to identify where the families are and get them re reunited with their families. Do, do you have a number? I do not. Health and Human Services is the POC, and I'd refer you to them. Let me get back to the phones. Um, Jack Detch, Foreign Policy. Hey, thanks for doing this, General. I'm curious if you have a, an outlay or a ballpark figure of how much it's going to cost to house um, Afghan refugees at U.S. bases. Thanks. I don't have uh, that figure. I, I would refer you uh, to the, for DOD purposes, to OSD and the Comptroller, but more broadly, probably to the lead federal agency. Apologize, I don't have that data. Okay, no problem. John, if you could take that, that'd be great. Jack, I will take it. I suspect that uh, we don't have a firm estimate right now as we are uh, really just in the middle of this uh, operation. But Jack, that's a fair question. We'll see what kind of context in terms of uh, costs we can get to you. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, General, I'm wondering if Christina Anderson, AWPS News, um, I'm wondering if you have at this early stage uh, demographics uh, among the task force groups, the, these tiny cities, and in particular about children with schools starting here in the U.S., um, what kinds of uh, organizational things are happening to try to make sure that children continue their education and anyone who is ready for university is able to kind of plug into that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Christina. For, first, I'll have to defer you to the, the lead for that as far as demographics. Uh, I think I talked a little bit about that last time. Um, you know, we're seeing close to 50-50 male-female with a large percentage of children, but I don't have the specifics. As far as education, again, the DOD is not the lead there. I would defer you to the State Department, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, and the lead federal agency for that information. What I will tell you, uh, it was incredibly heartwarming yesterday during my visit uh, to Task Force Liberty. We were walking through the village. Uh, there's hundreds of kids out. Uh, they have coloring books, they have toys. Uh, they're, they're with their families, they're with their friends. Uh, they're playing, hundreds of them playing soccer. And I even got to watch a congressman play hopscotch with a young uh, female uh, Afghan uh, uh, 
person that was there uh, and her heart was warmed and uh, she smiled uh, continuously. So it's, uh, it's, it's not like they're not doing anything. They're staying incredibly busy. Thank you. Louis. So General, it's Louis Martinez with ABC News. Um, it seems like the population um, has quadrupled since you, appear, you were with us last week in terms of the people that you had at these facilities. Um, and I know that at Fort Lee, it was initially for people who were in the SIV pipeline, so they were going through rather quickly. Um, are the majority now of these individuals who are in your camps, are they SIVs? And if they're not, how much time do you anticipate that they'll spend there um, if there's a certain process that's involved um, in terms of not being days, but maybe weeks or months? Hey, thanks, Louis. You're right, uh, Lee was primarily an SIV uh, event, and today the vast majority of the uh, Afghan population at Lee are in the SIV process. As far as the total number, I don't have a specific. I'd have to defer you to DHS and State Department of exactly uh, the breakout between SIV and uh, other asylum seekers, but uh, I, I would uh, venture uh, I'm speculating a little bit that uh, the vast majority are not SIVs at this time. They're uh, asylum seekers that will be determined how we're going to work uh, them through the process by DHS as the lead federal agency. And if I could follow up, sir, does that mean that they will remain at those facilities until they get asylum? Or like the other individuals in the SIV pipeline, do they get transferred out to NGOs that then find uh, housing for them? Uh, Louis, what, what I expect uh, in talking with Mr. Bob Fenton yesterday, and they're currently working through the process for uh, how we're going to onward move them, is that each of them will at a minimum go through the medical screening, uh, COVID vaccination. That's a, a requirement now for parole, parole being a term that uh, the state uses when you uh, release them into the, uh, the United States. Uh, as part of the uh, either special immigrant process or DHS as part of an asylum process. For the duration, that really depends on uh, the capacity we're going to have at each location and the policy decision that is currently being made right now on what uh, the, the processing is going to look like. That does not mean they'll be on DOD installations until they complete that process. Uh, once they go through their screening, once the policy is decided, uh, then they may be uh, released likely uh, in uh, to our country and go through the asylum process as guests of our country until they get their uh, either U.S. citizenship, green card, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, we got uh, time for just one more, and then I'm going to let the, the general close things out. Sam Legrone, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, general, thanks for uh, being here. Can we get an update on um, the relief operations in Haiti? Uh, and how those are going and what the U.S. participation is at the moment. Hey, Sam, I'll have to defer to Admiral Fowler at uh, Southcom. That's it in his AOR. Uh, maybe uh, John Kirby has more, but that's not something I'm responsible for. Yeah, Sam, we'll get you something. I don't have an update ready for today on that, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get you something. One, one last one. Go ahead, Barb. Um, John, can I have a quick follow-up to Louie? So what is your, what have you been told, what's your planning factor, if you will, on how long you have to pr have these military bases prepared and ready, capable to house Afghans. Because given what you're doing, you would have, somebody would have given you, you know, some kind of planning scenario, be ready for as long as. And when you talked about these uh, locations as villages, are families given separate housing? Are they together as a family, or are families in larger dormitories? How is the housing working also for single females and single males? Thanks, Barb. Great question. Let me answer that uh, last portion uh, first. So single males will have a single male a housing and living facilities. They will not be intermixed with children and the families. Families do have uh, separated areas where we try to put the families together. So some of these areas that are that are open, what we do is we put temporary walls up uh, to give privacy in accordance with their culture for, for the families. Uh, and uh, single females as well will be allowed the opportunity to have a single female 
uh, housing for them as well. The first part of your question, Barb, uh, let me make sure I understood that one. Can you go back to that? Uh, just to follow up on what Louis was asking, um, what have you, somebody would have said to you or the military as you construct these, uh, these uh, base locations to be prepared to conduct this mission for as long as, and what would that have been? What planning guidance have you been given, even if, it do, if it's more or less? What's the guidance you have on how long to be prepared to conduct this mission? Barb, we're prepared to conduct the mission until completion, uh, which will be determined by DHS as far as the processing. Uh, I would defer to John Kirby if he has additional information uh, that maybe OMB or another agency is planning for. But for me, I'm prepared to execute until told otherwise or mission complete. Thank you. Okay, with that, General, sir, I appreciate your time uh, today on a Friday. I'd like to turn it back over to you for any closing thoughts you might have, sir. Hey, uh, thanks, John, and thanks to the press corps there. It's a great opportunity to share this story. I think there's some incredibly uh, positive stories that can come out of uh, the ongoing mission of Operation Allies Welcome, and I've been able to see those. It's a Herculean effort that started all the way in Afghanistan uh, and is working its way all the way here uh, to the United States of America. I can't tell you how impressed I really am with our joint force, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Guardians, Coast Guardsmen, partnered with the interagency and volunteers that are making this mission happen. The pride is simply amazing that I see when I go out and do this. And the smiles and the gratitude and the graciousness of our guests, you cannot overstate uh, how much they appreciate uh, what our teams are doing. The states, the local communities, the volunteers that are coming out, uh, it's just amazing. And that's a story that we have to continue to tell. I will tell you the mission is not over. And for us, it's actually just beginning. Much to accomplish in the coming days and weeks. And we look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Homeland Security and the rest of the interagency uh, to accomplish this mission. You know, I know that uh, DOD and our interagency partners are up to this task. That's what we do uh, in the department. That's what we do as Americans. And it's great to be part of this mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Appreciate your time today. Okay, I do have a couple of things at the top here, and then uh, I can stick around and take some questions if you have them. Uh, to piggyback on to the general's comments about wildfire, wildfire support, uh, with the continuing significant fire, uh, fires in the western United States, the Department of Defense is delivering requested personnel, equipment, and facilities to assist federal, state, and local partners as they fight these wildfires. One of the tools provided by the department is the Firefly System pilot program. It's a capability from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, uh, Firefly provides imagery information from satellites, drones, ground sensors, and cameras, giving wildfire agencies the location and shape of probable fires. It assists with fire mapping and tactical decision support. Firefly offers regular updates up to 15-minute intervals on areas of fire growth and activity without cost or exposure uh, of aircraft. Recognizing the continuing value of this pilot program, uh, the department recently approved an extension of Firefly support through September of 2022. This extension will provide time for the National Interagency Fire Center in consultation with the Department of Defense to develop a viable long-term solution for future funding and operation of Firefly. Finally, I think you heard the Secretary uh, mention the other day that he'll be going to the Gulf region uh, here next week. Um, the, we, we, we depart uh, on Sunday, uh, September 5th, to visit Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Throughout this trip, the Secretary will be meeting with regional partners and uh, military leaders as well, U.S. military leaders as well, to thank them for their cooperation with the United States as we evacuated Americans, Afghans, and citizens from other nations from Afghanistan. He will, of course, reaffirm our strong defense relationships in the region uh, and, again, thank them for their superb support. He'll have a chance to talk to U.S. service members and other uh, government personnel, to including including our, uh, our, our diplomat colleagues, uh, to thank them for, again, the skill and professionalism with which they have conducted and continue to, to conduct this, uh, uh, this onward movement of people. So with that, I can take some questions. Travis. Um, John, I wanted to piggyback on a 
previous questions on what the general said about the length of time that they may be housing the Afghans. And it sounded like from what he said, it, it's in, it, it could be indefinitely. And I'm just wondering if you could give us some more clarity on that. I mean, is it the plan to do this through October with the possibility of an extension? Or can you give us some more clarity so it just doesn't sound like this is indefinitely? Yeah, I wouldn't want to get confused. I don't think the general meant to indicate that the, that the stay at a base is going to be indefinite. That is not the plan. Uh, these are temporary housing locations to help these individuals as they complete their process. And many of them, to Louis's question, are on different process timelines. Um, if you're an SIV and you're far farther in the process, then obviously it won't be as long as somebody who's not in that, in that program. So it's going to vary case by case. But what he was talking about was the mission itself, the general support by DOD to our interagency partners. Uh, there's not a, a deadline on that. Uh, we're, as he said, we're just at the beginning of this. And so we'll, we'll support our interagency partners with the housing function we're providing for as long as they need it. That's different than saying an individual family or individual Afghan is going to be on a base for an indefinite period of time. There's a, there's a process, but each one will be different based on the, the individual case. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. In the back there. Thanks. Mike Brass with the Washington Examiner. Uh, DOD still hasn't said who the targets of the airstrikes were. Can you tell us who the targets were, and if not, why not? I don't believe we've refused to say who they are. We haven't given you names, but we, we absolutely had solid intelligence that this was, uh, that this was ISIS uh, individuals who were uh, in, the, in the act of imminently carrying out a direct threat to the airport uh, and to our people, and potentially to innocent lives outside the airport. The intelligence was very good. Uh, and we, we took the strike in, in as timely a fashion as we could to prevent this imminent threat. There's, uh, there's no question on the department's mind that it was a valid threat, valid target, uh, and related to, to ISIS-K. Okay. Louis. Uh, yesterday, General Walter spoke about a 10-day limit for individuals in, in UCOM. Right. What, what exactly is that? And is there a limit for the individuals in the CENTCOM countries? Uh, let me get back to you on the CENTCOM. I don't know. I'd have to get that from Central Command, Louis. What the general was talking about in Europe, uh, these countries have asked that we keep people no longer than 10 days at these, uh, at these facilities. And I think he talked about how we're, we're working with the, the countries. We're, gener we're grateful for their generosity, and we're working very hard to meet those, those guidelines as best we can. I'll have to take the question on CENTCOM. I don't know if there's similar limits on time frame. Obviously, there's different capacity. Uh, capabilities at each of the uh, countries in the region and Central Command that, that are helping us host some of these individuals, but I'm not sure that there's a time limit thing on it. Each of those, I think his number he said yesterday was like 20,000 people, 23,000 people are and still in UCOM are going to the United States or are they going to be housed in other countries? Um, that that uh, most of, we anticipate most will be coming to the United States, but not all. Um, uh, uh, and that's a, again, to some degree, that'll that'll be determined by the individual family members and and you know the people that left Afghanistan. We can't assume that each and every single one of them want the United States to be their final destination. So, so if that clock holds, I mean, I think it's by next Wednesday, you would have to have all of those individuals back to the United States. Well, or or or, or not at the not at, at the bases where they're at right now, not necessarily all back to the United States. And again, yeah. the general's better to talk to that. I think he mentioned, he talked about that yesterday. Thank yeah. You. Oh, thank you. Two different questions. First, uh, the secretary said in the past that in the Pacific is a priority theater in the face of the pacing threat of China. Does he still stand by his earlier statement now that the Taliban took over? Afghanistan and the threat of terrorism could increase in the near future. The Secretary still intends to prioritize the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, absolutely. Nothing's changed about that. Um, and you've heard us talk before that in, in, in many ways that the terrorist threat, certainly to our interest and the interests of our allies and partners, has metastasized outside Afghanistan. And we're not going to lose focus on that. You heard him say that just the other day. Uh, we're going to stay laser focused on making sure we have the capabilities we need to, uh, to conduct over the horizon counterterrorism capabilities, not just in Afghanistan, but, but, but elsewhere around the world.
But nothing's changed about our our focus on the Indo-Pacific region. It's no accident that you know his first trip was to that uh, to that part of the world, and in fact, he, he went just recently again to to Southeast Asia. Uh, this trip next week uh, will be his first trip to the Middle East since becoming Secretary of Defense, and obviously uh, uh, a very opportune moment for him to be able to thank these countries for their support. Okay. Oh. The separate question. The DOD was supposed to complete the global post posture review by as early as late summer. Are you still on track to uh, meet that timeline uh, even after the recent event in Afghanistan? Yeah, the team is still working on this, and I think we're still basically where we need to be in terms of the timeline. Yeah. John, uh, on um, the evacuees, can you tell us if, are there, uh, if there are any military Afghan military members, service members among the evacuees. Yes, evacuees. there are some. And also on, on the, the strike in, in Nangarhar, you can you why did you name those uh, high level, high profile uh, ISIS officials yet? Uh, you don't have the names. You just no, we know who they are. I think uh, w at the time we didn't release the names because uh, we were being. Um, uh, we were in the middle of a very fluid uh, threat environment. Let me see if, uh, you know, if that's information that can be provided now. I don't know. I mean, I, we know who they are. I don't know if it's information that, uh, that we're going to be able to provide right now. Yeah, Christine. Um, so back to um, these, these uh, task force bases um, here in the U.S. Uh, on the longer-term stays, um, will there be plans to include among the activities for the children educational types of activities, you know, beginning English, some of those kinds of things perhaps? I don't know how long the stay would be, but it seems to me that, you know, just having them play day by day is a good thing, but, you know, some educational activity wouldn't. I, I would refer you to HHS. Uh, that's really their role. Uh, again, I think it's to, to remind our, our job is to provide temporary housing space food, water, sustenance, shelter, uh, 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 religious accommodations, obviously, uh, to make these individuals as comfortable as possible while they go through this process. But, uh, but you're asking, you know, th those kinds of questions are, are, are better put to, to HHS and not the Department of Defense. Sorry. Courtney? Yeah, um, I just want to, now that, that there is a little bit of time that the U.S. has been out, um, is there a, a more clarity on what the CT strikes, like who could be targeted under the CT strikes? Obviously, ISIS-K, we've heard about that. I'm assuming Al-Qaeda. What about Haqqani? Are they a legitimate a, a target that the U.S. will be, uh, could potentially be targeting with uh, counter-terror strikes in Afghanistan going forward? Yeah, I, I don't want to hypothesize about potential future operations, uh, Courtney. What I will tell you is that we maintain uh, the capability um, uh, and the responsibility uh, to conduct counterterrorism strikes that we believe are in the best interest of the United States of America and the American people that we defend. And I think I'd just leave it at that. So, because there is at least one Haqqani leader, Siraj Haqqani, who there's a, a, a $5 million, um, what's the term, um, against him by the FBI. The, the FBI have offered $5 million for information about him. So, th theoretically, he's wanted in the United States would he be a legitimate counterterror target for U.S. military operate for U.S. military there? We will conduct counterterrorism operations that we believe are uh, are in the interest of protecting our interests and uh, and the American people. Uh, and when there is, you know, the the credible threat uh, that needs to be dealt with, and I don't want to speculate about each and every possible circumstance or each and every possible target. I, I think you can understand why we wouldn't want to do that right now. And then one more on that. Who, how, now that there's no U.S. military presence there, who <laughs> has the authority? So does that have to, every single time that, that now General McKenzie has a potential target, does he have to get permission from the White House or from Secretary of Defense to, to conduct strikes in Afghanistan going forward? And then I know I've asked this before, but I'll ask it again just to see if there's more clarity. Now that the Taliban are, are the, running the government in Afghanistan, will, will the U.S. T go to them in advance of strikes, not for necessarily approval, but as coordination or? Yeah, I, I think both the secretary and the chairman talked about this just the other day. They didn't, uh, uh, you know, they didn't want to uh, leave anybody with the notion that we were somehow going to be in some long-term enduring 
manufactured cooperation agreement with the Taliban. Uh, but to your last question, I mean, each, each case is going to be dealt with specifically to that case. And that, in, that includes, you know, issues of, uh, of authorities. Obviously, General McKenzie has authorities to conduct counterterrorism operations inside his area of responsibility, and we leave it to him and his good judgment uh, to determine um, how much uh, beyond his own authorities does he want, does he need, to, does he want to act or, or consult. Um, but every case is going to be dealt with differently. So, uh, again, I think the secretary and the chairman laid it out pretty clear. We're not, you know, no, nobody's trying to ink some sort of uh, military cooperation agreement with the, with the Taliban, but the, they wouldn't rule out that there might be occasions when uh, there might need to be um, uh, some informational component there with, with the Taliban going forward. I, I, I don't we shouldn't get lost. Nothing should be lost about the, the fact that we're go we have a robust over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability. We're going to try to make it more robust. We're still in discussions with partner nations about being able to make it more robust. Um, and, and we're going to continue to explore options. Again, it's about defending our interests and our people and, and, uh, and the American homeland and making sure that places like Afghanistan can't become uh, a place where that kind of a threat, like what happened on 9-11, can happen again. Barbara. Uh, I want to clarify something you just said to Courtney, please. Um, I think I heard you correctly. You said you leave it to General McKenzie to decide when he needs to consult. Right. I know there is a fascination here about, no, Barb, wait, hang on just a second. It's fascination here over authorities. And, uh, and the cases when a commander can do something on his or her own or they have to float it up the chain of command. I am not going to get into a detailed discussion today about authorities for strikes that haven't happened yet and for operations that aren't planned and aren't, and aren't on the calendar yet. Uh, we, with a whole, hang on, please. The whole national security team is involved in monitoring the threat streams and, and uh, the intelligence, uh, and there is in many cases, um, frequent dialogue uh, across the chain of command about taking the appropriate action. And, and it, uh, the interest in authorities is interesting. It's not necessarily relevant to the overall mission, which is to prevent our nation from being attacked again. So my question actually is, uh, well, that's a very good explanation. My question is, you said if I am repeating this accurately, it is up to General McKenzie to decide when he needs to consult. I'm wondering, given everything, maybe I just misunderstood you. Um, there are processes and procedures. A four-star, one in charge of a, operations in a particular part of the world, it wouldn't just be left up to him to decide whether he thinks he needs to tell the president or the White House or the secretary or the chairman. Um, I'm not trying to ask about hypotheticals. I'm just trying to ask, is that really the case that General McKenzie gets to decide? Or did I misunderstand you? There will be, he has authorities, Barb, and there will be times when he'll be able to act on those authorities. Um, there will be other occasions, potentially, uh, where there'll need to be a broader discussion uh, about the intelligence we're seeing and about the uh, about the capabilities we can bring to bear to deal with that particular threat. And General McKenzie, what I, if, if I, I'll have to go back and look at exactly what I said, but <laughs> General McKenzie understands uh, uh, how to do this, and as do all the other combatant commanders, quite frankly. It's not just Central Command. Uh, uh, other geographic combatant commands are dealing with terrorist threats in Africa and even in the Indo-Pacific. They, um, they understand um, the authorities that they have, and they also understand that even within those authorities, there might be times when a broader discussion uh, is, uh, is warranted. Um, and I think, again, um, it, it's not a useful exercise to go through the authorities on each and every possible strike. What matters is that the American people know, A, we have the capability and we're going to keep the capability, and we're going to try to make it more robust. And B, we're not going to lose sight on the threat. 
going forward. And it's difficult for me on the 3rd of September to tell you exactly what that threat's going to look like in any part of the world on any particular day, except to say that our combatant commanders know the authorities they have, they know the responsibilities they have, um, and, they will, and they will act accordingly. I think the reason that, the, like, I'm glad that the combatant commanders have know their authorities. I would be troubled if they didn't. But I think the reason that we're asking here is because now the situation has changed. There's been 20 years that we've been covering this war, and now the situation on the ground has changed. There's no military there, and it's not, and, and we're trying to understand to inform our own reporting how things go going forward. I, I don't think we're asking you specifically can you give us the date and time of each strike and who it's going to be targeting and where, but more, just more broadly how this process is going to work going forward. And I think that that, that kind of process stuff, you know, call us wonky, it wouldn't be the worst thing this press corps has been called before, but, but I think that only informs our own reporting to understand how, how it's going to work. So if it's possible that, that anyone can explain that, that going forward, even in a broad yeah, sense. Courtney, right? again, I, I think maybe I failed. Perhaps I utterly failed here to try to explain it going not forward. To, but, not to your face. But, uh, but uh, I, I just don't think it's a useful exercise to talk about every authority process for every potential strike we're going to take. Um, uh, just rest assured that, that our combatant commanders have the authorities they need. Uh, and if there's a need uh, to have a broader discussion inside the, inside the national security team about a potential target, we'll, we'll do that. Um, it is not uncommon that that hasn't happened in the past, and I suspect that that'll happen in the future. Uh, but you're right, the situation is different. Um, and that's exactly the point I guess I'm trying to make, is that because the situation is different, uh, you know, these, are, these, these will be taken almost on an individual basis. Can I have a yeah, sure. Um, could you talk a little bit about the urgency of the opportunity in a strike? Is, does that, is that a factor in this too sometimes? Time and urgency is always a factor when you're getting ready to, to take a, a, a strike, particularly against a, um, a legitimate terrorist threat. Okay, I got to go. Yeah, go ahead. What is the U.S. final destination of the military mission against the terrorists? U.S. will fighting forever to uh, Taliban, uh, ISK, or another terrorist? What? Do you have any uh, destination for the final destination? A destination? Yes, uh, final destination of the U.S. Final destination of the U.S. when it comes to terrorist threats. I mean, I, I think it's been pretty clear. We want to make sure that we can uh, avoid, prevent, stop uh, a terrorist threat from from endangering the lives of of the American people, like like it happened nearly 20 years ago. And that was why we went to Afghanistan, uh, and it, it was still the goal. It, it is still the goal, not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere around the world, to uh, um, to eliminate those kinds of threats to our to our interests and to our people, uh, to our allies and partners from from legitimate uh, terrorist activity, which again, as I said, has metastasized away from Afghanistan uh, in, in recent years, uh, to North Africa, into the in, into other places of the Middle East, uh, and so we're not going to lose sight on that. We're just not going to lose sight on that. The, the Secretary's number one priority, if you go back and look at his message to the force when he took over, is defend the nation. There's a lot you wrap in to defend the nation, a lot. Part of it is the e existent terrorist threat and the future terrorist threat, and making sure that we're not losing focus on that. All right, thank okay? you. Thank you.